Hi guys, my name is Jordan, and in this video, we're going to be creating some naturalistic formicaria containing soil, plants, and other crucial organisms. Basically, mini ecosystems perfectly catered for the keeping of ants. To start off, you're going to need an enclosure of some sort. To give you guys some options, I'm going with three distinctive styles. The first, one of our medium sized Ants Australia outwalls made of acrylic. The second, a tall glass jar. And thirdly, a four foot long glass fish tank. I prefer enclosures with flat sides and avoid ones which have rounded sides, like this cylindrical jar, as viewing through results in visual distortion, making it hard to observe anything inside in any great detail. Much like viewing ants within test tube setups. But I'm gonna try it out, just for the sake of variety. The size of enclosure you go for should depend on the size of your ant colony and how much growing room they'll need over time. Typically, the larger the setup, the better. Although, just keep in mind, the larger you go, the more you'll need to invest into materials and general maintenance. Once you've picked an enclosure which best suits your needs, we're going to start layering in our substrate. What we'll first need to do is create a drainage layer. I'm creating mine by laying down some small stones. Before filling up one of our outworlds, however, I'm going to need to seal off the entrance port. To do this, I'm simply unscrewing the front panel and replacing it with a solid one, which comes included in the kit. All ready to go. Try to lay the stones down evenly, just a few centimeters high is plenty. A great alternative to stones are clay balls. Clay is much lighter than rock, making it much more suitable for larger setups as it'll make it a little easier to transport later on, if need be. This drainage layer will help prevent your soil, which we'll be adding in later on, from becoming waterlogged, which can cause the substrate to rot, thus providing ideal conditions for harmful bacteria and fungi to thrive. So the idea is that any excess water in your setup will seep down through the substrate above and then settle within the small gaps between all the rocks or clay below allowing the soil to sufficiently drain and dry out. Next, what we need to do is cover over your drainage layer. This is to prevent the soil above from entering and thus inhibiting its effectiveness. For this large setup, I'm using some shade cloth, which has been cut to shape. Some fine window screen would work great for this too. Or for a more natural approach, a carpet of moss or coconut husk acts as an excellent alternative. Not only will it filter out the soil, but it will absorb up any excess moisture too. For my smaller setups here, I'm going with some coconut husk. Make sure you've covered the entire surface area so there aren't any gaps. Next step, we're adding in a layer of charcoal. When water passes down through this layer and into the drainage layer below, the charcoal helps purify it. It acts like a sponge, absorbing in the water and neutralizing certain toxins within, lessening the chance of harmful microbes building up. Just make sure the charcoal you use doesn't have any added chemicals. Finally, it's time to add in some soil. For these two, I'm adding in some potting mix specially designed for terraria. And for the fish tank, some soil from my backyard. What sort of substrate you go for should depend on what your ants like. Some species might prefer rather dense and sandy soil, whereas others might prefer more of a loose, bark-like substrate. So do a bit of research, go outside and have a look at what sort of substrate the particular species you intend on housing are usually found in. 
You can also do some experimenting by filling one side of your setup with one type of substrate and the other with something different and simply observe which side the ants prefer. You'll want to add in a decent layer of substrate to give the ants plenty of room for constructing their tunnels and chambers. And if you're going to be adding in some plants, just make sure you leave enough vertical space for them to grow in. You'll notice I'm not layering the soil flat like I did in the previous stages. Instead, I'm sloping the surface downwards towards the front and creating subtle hills and valleys. This gives the ants an increased amount of surface area to explore and gives the setup some added dimension too. Next comes the fun part, the decorating. For this setup, I'm first adding in some plants. You'll need to carefully consider which plants will best suit your particular setup and the ants which will inhabit it. For example, it wouldn't be a good idea to pick water loving plants when you're housing an ant species which prefers relatively dry conditions, as it may be quite tricky trying to please them both. And other things to consider would be the soil conditions. Does the soil that you pick for your ants also suit the plants? And of course, lighting. How much and what sort of light do the plants require? Will they get enough light naturally from a nearby window? Or might they need artificial lighting? For my outworld setup here, I haven't got a whole lot of vertical space to work with. So I picked some low growing plants, which will, in time, entirely carpet the surface. Tallest plants to the back is best. And then I'm adding in some small rocks, sticks, and a gum nut. And finally, I'm filling in any remaining gaps with a bit of coconut husk. For my jar setup, I'm keeping things super basic. All I'm doing is simply placing in some seeds, which in about a week or two, will begin to germinate and spring to life. These seeds are from an easy to grow herb known as peppermint. So not only will this add some greenery to the setup, but it'll also give off a pleasant minty aroma. And of course, tastes great too. And finally, for my large tank setup, I've added in some large bits of driftwood Plenty of rocks too. I found ants often love nesting directly beneath solid surfaces, such as these, utilizing them as a sturdy ceiling for their homes. So hopefully this will make mine feel right at home. If the ants you're going to be housing are a wood dwelling species, like carpenter ants, then some small branches would be much appreciated for them. And to liven up the setup, I've also added in some small tussocks of grass and some beautifully vibrant mosses. And for the finishing touch, a thin layer of red sand found naturally throughout central Australia. I think it gives everything some nice contrast. Once you're happy with your design, it's time to hydrate. Regular tap water is fine for this, although you're probably best using rain or distilled water so as to avoid adding in any unwanted chemicals. How much and how often you water should depend on the size of your setup, its evaporation rates, and what sort of humidity levels your inhabitants require. I highly recommend placing in a hygrometer so you can accurately gauge these levels I've secured one on the inside of my jar setup, just using some blue tack like so. You might want to also leave some dry patches throughout the setup, giving the ants a moisture gradient to work with. If you're using one of our outworlds, just be aware that they aren't watertight, so if you flood one, the water will slowly leak out from the bottom. I'm putting a little potting tray beneath mine, so as to protect the surface of the table beneath. This leakage, while seemingly impractical, is actually quite a good thing, as it allows for improved drainage, reducing the chances of harmful bacteria and fungi from developing, and catering better for arid dwelling ant species. And 
plants like succulents, which do best when their roots periodically dry out. Plus, if you fill your tray with water, it can act like a moat, discouraging the ants from escaping, and foreign ants from invading. However, the most effective way to escape proof your setup, and prevent wild ants from invading, would be to apply a barrier of PTFE all around the upper inner edges of your enclosure. Before you apply this liquid, make sure you clear the surface area of any dust and moisture. For my Outworld setup, I'm simply coating the inner edges bordering the lid, using a cotton Q-tip, like so. Once this liquid dries, the area becomes super slippery, making it very difficult for ants to pass over it without losing their grip and falling back down to the bottom. For the jar setup, normally I would coat this area here. However, the ants I'm going to be housing are incapable of climbing up smooth surfaces like plastic and glass, so no fluon required for them. And lastly, for the fish tank, a barrier around this area would be sufficient for containing most ant species. Although some ants, who are a little more adept at climbing, will likely have no troubles scaling up the silicon sealant in the corners. Silicon isn't as smooth a surface as glass, and so, even when it's coated in fluon, it proves to create weak points in the barrier. So for my setup, I'm not taking any chances. Instead, I'm utilizing one of our custom-designed, laser-cut acrylic lids which has been secured on with some aquarium safe silicon. The lid has a large opening on either side, the only way in and out. Once the inner edges of which are coated with fluon, the ants would need to walk upside down over the barrier. Definitely not an easy task. The lids are also lined with thousands of tiny holes for ventilation, much like the sliding lids featured on our outwards. If you wanted to make a lid similar to this yourself, you could get a sheet of acrylic and cut it to shape using a specialized blade. For extra security, a tight fitting lid is definitely a great option. Just be aware that closing off your enclosure will reduce evaporation rates and increase the humidity levels within, so you won't need to hydrate the setup nearly as often. This high humidity may also result in condensation buildup, thus rendering your floor and barrier ineffective so it's a good idea to use a lid which offers plenty of ventilation, like these ones. Alright, almost done now. Next, we're adding in a cleanup crew. Some helpful bugs in the form of springtails and isopods. These bugs will actively consume any organic matter, like dead leaves and fungi, and then excrete them out as fertilizer, cleansing and enriching the soil. You just have to be a little bit careful with the bugs that you choose however. In some cases, the ants might see them as food and relentlessly seek out and attack them. I found that most ant species don't really go after springtails. I think it's because they're far too small and agile to be worth the effort in catching. So I'm adding in a bunch to mine. And another great thing about springtails is that they're very easy to raise. Here's a culture I started a few months back, just from a couple of hundred individuals. Now, they must be well into the tens of thousands strong. Now the cleanup crew's in, we're finally ready to add in some ants. For my Outworld setup, I'm going for a young colony of strobe ants of the genus Opisthopsis who are currently housed in a tubs and tube setup. I'm simply removing their tube and placing it straight in, like so. For the jar setup, I'm introducing a small colony of green-headed ants of the genus Rytidopinera, also from a test tube setup. One which isn't looking so great. You can see the cotton's starting to get a little bit moldy so they're more than ready to be moved out. Again, I'm just placing the tube directly into the enclosure. And finally, for my fish tank, I'm introducing a colony of Australia's iconic giant bull ants, Mimesia pyroformis, which I currently have housed within a couple of white nests, 
hooked up to one of our large sized outworlds. This particular species of ant is one of the largest in the world, with workers measuring in at around 30 millimeters in length. And the queens even larger still. And as you can see, this colony is quite large too. They currently have around 40 workers present, and there's lots more on the way. Just look at all that brood. I love how they've neatly organized them based on what level of development they're at. First you've got the eggs, then the larvae, and finally, the pupae. So to introduce these guys, using light, I've managed to move them all into a single nest. And from here, I'm simply placing this nest directly into the tank and setting them free. To entice the ants to move out of their old nests, there's a few things that you can do. Firstly, try poking some shallow holes into the soil to save the ants some digging. Ants are all about efficiency, so offering them a head start acts as a great incentive for them to move in. Also, in this way, you can essentially dictate the general area the ants will end up nesting in. For example, you might want them closer towards the front, so you can potentially get a better view of their underground activity. Additionally, you can use some heat to entice the ants further, using a heating mat or cable. For my big headed ant setup, which has undergone quite the rescape since featured last, I'm currently using a heat mat, which I've secured onto the front. As you can see, the ants love nesting right up against it, offering an excellent view of their activity. Alternatively, if you're running lights over your setup, or just other appliances nearby, you can utilize the heat radiating from their power plugs. Here's a setup we created a few months back, home to a large colony of golden-tailed sugar ants. You can see they really appreciate the warmth in which these power packs provide, maneuvering the majority of their brood within clear view right up against the glass. Here I'm doing the same thing for the bull ants too so hopefully I get some similar results. You can also try feeding the ants, only some small portions, just so that the ants get a taste of the food, encouraging them to seek out more, thus inadvertently getting them to explore and become more comfortable in their new environment. Here I'm offering the bull ants some raw honey, served in an acorn cupule, which acts as a neat little natural feeding dish. And of course, exposing the ants to light is always a good way to get them moving. Just make sure they're not exposed to direct sunlight or overly hot lights, as this may cause the ants to overheat and or result in excessive condensation buildup within their nest, which could potentially drown the ants. In my case, it wasn't long before the strobe ants began exploring their new environment. Notice these ants move in a rather jittery fashion. It's almost like you're watching them at 10 frames a second, hence their common name of strobe ant. Their eyes are also quite large in respect to their bodies, and unusually, they're positioned towards the back of their heads. This allows them almost a 360 degree field of view. Very unique ants for sure. The reason I picked them out for this particular setup is because these strobe ants are from up north in Queensland and so are well suited to high humidity levels in which this enclosure provides. Shout out to Eli over at Ant Invasion for sending us these guys. I highly recommend checking out his YouTube channel. I'll leave the link in the description below. A couple of weeks on, these strobe ants are still yet to move out from their test tube. Young ant colonies, with only a few workers present, tend to be quite hesitant to abandon their familiar home for a new one, especially since it's been working so well for them for so long. So I may be waiting quite a while before these guys build up the courage to move. So when moving ants, 
A little patience may be needed, as is often the case when it comes to ant keeping. As for the green-headed ants on the other hand, as soon as I placed them in, the workers poured out and immediately began burrowing into the soil, right by the entrance of their tube. Their hard work quickly drew the attention of the other inhabitants, the isopods and springtails. They felt that the ants' newly dug chamber was the perfect spot to seek shelter from the harsh filming lights above, and opportunistically squeeze themselves in. And pretty soon, the queen came along to join the party too. Ants weren't too happy with the presence of the isopods, eventually driving them off with a quick succession of bites. But they weren't at all fussed with the springtails. The two tend to get along quite well, which seems to be a common theme with green-headed ants. Whenever I uncover a wild nest, I almost always see an abundance of springtails living happily amongst them. As you can imagine, these green-headed ants get their name for their shimmering green coloration, but they're incredibly iridescent, ranging from green, to red, to purple, and even gold. Very pretty looking ants. For the bull ants, same as the greenheads, they started digging in almost immediately, favoring the underside of this small rock right beside their nest. And eventually, after perhaps discovering the warmth of the power plugs, they started excavating a little higher up too, beneath this piece of wood here. And amongst the rocks above. Fast forward about 12 hours later. And they'd completely moved in, leaving not so much as a single egg behind. Removing their old nest revealed just how busy the ants had been. Just look at all that uplifted soil. Here you can see the before and after. It's amazing just how productive ants can be. So what do you guys think of these naturalistic setups? Aesthetically speaking, it's pretty hard to beat something like this. The greenery really livens up a room. And arguably, when they're done right, I think they're one of the most effective ways to keep ants too, as they allow the ants to dig, expand, and fine tune their nest, however they see fit, making them a perfect environment for raising just a single queen, all the way up to a mature colony, thousands of workers strong. They really are designed to go the distance. Take my big headed ant colony for example, these guys have been living in this same natural setup for over two years now, and it's pretty safe to say they're doing very well. It's always a good sign you've got a thriving colony when they begin producing winged reproductors, especially when they come out in the thousands. Plus, with these setups, you won't just be observing the growth of your ant colony, but the growth of the plants too. Here's my jar setup a few weeks on. You can see those peppermint seeds I sprinkled in have finally begun to germinate. Aren't they just adorable? Or is that just me? There's also a lot less maintenance involved with these setups too. In a more traditional setup, any garbage the ants produce will eventually need to be cleaned out by the keeper. But with a naturalistic setup, organisms in the soil slowly decompose such waste. So other than keeping the plants trimmed and hydrated, there's really very little extra work that needs to be done. Of course, there are some downsides. You likely won't be able to get as clear a view of all the ants' nesting activities as you would within a more traditional setup. But for some, watching the ants come up to forage 
and maybe occasionally seeing some tunnels and chambers up against the sides is more than enough. If you want to stay updated on how these colonies progress, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. We've got a lot of ants we've still yet to show you guys, and it'll take a long while before I get through them all. If you're not the patient type, I highly recommend following us on Instagram. Here we post daily stories on everything ants, whether it be quick updates on our colonies, or behind the scenes on future projects. Alright, now onto our regular contest, where we give away one of our specially built former carrier. In last video's contest, I asked, how has your interest in ants impacted you as a person? For me, as you can imagine, ants have made quite a big impact. From a young age, I've always had a deep interest in the natural world, especially the small creatures, which often go unnoticed, and so was naturally drawn to ants. Later in life, I learned the joys of keeping and studying ants, and soon started sharing these findings with you guys, in the form of videos like these. And eventually, I founded our website and online store for all things ant keeping, which in turn allowed me to meet and learn from some amazing people and open myself up to new opportunities, of which I never expected to have, like doing talks for schools and even appearing on Australian television, all thanks to ants. But of course, none of these things would have been possible without you guys and your incredible support throughout the years. You've really driven me to pursue my passion and for that, I'm incredibly grateful. So thank you guys so much. So the winner of the contest is Lemonhole123, who responded, Keeping ants has changed my life for the better. It has shown me the beauty of nature and also the ugly side too. This has formed an ongoing love for the outdoors and for animals of all varieties. I've started to find myself stopping all my friends from stepping on ants just for the beauty of these creatures big and small. So congratulations Lemonhole, with this entry you've just won yourself one of our size 1 Whitong nests. It seems a lot of people simply neglect the beautiful intricacies of nature. A state of mind us humans really must change, now more than ever before. So it's really refreshing to hear that you, and many other entrants for this contest, have now become more attuned to nature, thanks to ants. For our next video's contest, to celebrate the release of our new purpose-built outworlds, we're going to be giving one away. To enter, simply answer the following. What made you want to keep ants? If you're currently not keeping ants, why not? So post your answer in the comment section below. We'll pick out a single comment and announce them as the winner in our next video. As always, thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed.